Pam, are you ready? All right. I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Ask everyone to silence their cell phones. <laughs> Roll call. Kim Bailey. Here. Barbara Boucher. Here. Maria Davies. Susan Edmondson. Here. Ruth Johnson. Here. Ryan Westcoat. Kim York. Here. Um, and I will mention, um, let's see, I believe Mr. Westcoat will be joining us later. And um, Maria already, their family had a trip planned, I believe. So we will miss, uh, or miss her, and he will join us shortly. All right, if everyone would join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> everyone for being here this evening. Um, we always begin with our mission <coughs> statement, which is preparing each student for a successful and meaningful life. We'll start with the approval of our agenda. Is there a motion? I move to approve the agenda as presented. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes. First up, we have some recognitions this evening. I'll turn that over to Dr. Monsis. Join me up front. We have two recognitions we'd like to celebrate with the board this evening, and the first one was here just last month. Uh, he's a regular here at the board meeting. Uh, last month he was here for winning the Ray Peck Spelling Bee for the fourth consecutive year, and now this month we have him back as the now three-time winner of the Cass County Spelling Bee, so Joel Miles, if you'll come forward. So I'm sure Joel is studying as hard as he can, and he'll be heading to D.C. for the National B towards the end of May, and uh, really want to congratulate him for his outstanding career in this endeavor. Uh, as an eighth grader, he is now to the end of his eligibility, so to speak. So uh, we wish him luck at, at his last go-round in D.C. Congratulations. able to attend the spelling bee and you were phenomenal there at the end you and Harrisonville were very good it was and, fun to watch and if you weren't there they went 59 rounds before they were able to declare a winner so and they both breezed right through it now there are there are, there is pressure in many things that we do but I don't think I've ever been under that much pressure so <laughs> All right, Susan, if you'll come forward. We'd also like to recognize one of our Board of Education members this year, and a lot of our patrons may not be aware that as board members, um, <clears throat> you have to go through some uh, uh, formal training to, to be in your position. I think in your first year, you're required to do about 16 hours worth of training, and M Missouri School Boards Association has a uh, credentialing process to where if you continue on and do more professional development, more training, uh, you can move up the ladder and earn advanced certificates, master certificates, <laughs> And then in uh, 2015, they created a new category for those who wanted to extend themselves even further and created a, a distinguished uh, board member award program. And we have a board member who has now earned that, and um, I would call Ruth Johnson forward. Now, as they're taking the photos, I'll share a few things that Ruth had to do. In addition to the regular workshops and, and uh, regional meetings and things like that, she had to do a book study. Uh, she had to attend uh, board meetings in other districts, uh, take a leadership role in various efforts through MSBA, and, and as well as going above and beyond in areas like advocacy, uh, presentations at conferences, things of that sort. So she really has done a lot in her role as a board member for our district and through the state as a whole. And many of her from, are, uh, you are familiar with her efforts to help with Cass, Cass County Kids First, which is involved with legislative ad advocacy along with all the rest of the board. And just so you know, there are, have been so far five board members in the state to earn that award, and she's one of those five. So congratulations. <laughs> Normally at this time we tell people it's okay to leave. Uh, it is okay to leave, <laughs> except Ruth. <laughs> May not. <laughs> All right. Okay.
Okay, we'll move on to the consent uh, items, the consent agenda. Is there a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there a second? I second. Okay. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes. All right, um, public comments this evening. We have uh, one person signed up for public comments tonight. Um, Mr. Paul Kaufman, if you would come on up. Um, and just uh, to refresh everyone's memory, because it's been a while since we've had public comments, uh, anyone can sign up, and uh, we do limit it to three minutes, and just, you know, for the sake of time. Okay, Mr. well, Mr. Kaufman, um, welcome, and... Yes, my name is Paul Kaufman, and I am running for school board, and, um, you know, I've had a lot of questions, talked to a lot of uh, principals and teachers, and uh, one of my questions would be about school board conduct, and I recently came across something online um, uh, written by Barb Boucher. It says, filing has begun for the Ray Moore Peculiar School Board. Having served two terms in the board, working with two very different boards over the past decade, I believe our, patients, uh, our patrons should be concerned about the incumbents and one pat patron who has filed for re-election. And kind of goes on, says, sadly, I have served with the majority of the current board who I have never seen cast a vote opposing any of the administrative decisions. And just, I'm just wondering, do you, is it common practice to tweet or put online um, concerns, or would it be more of a, a practice to go to the person that you had a <coughs> disagreement with in private, I mean, you know, being someone who may be elected to the school board, I would, you know, hope that things could be handled internally more than publicly. And I'll sit down, and if anybody would like to answer that question, uh, I would like to find out what the answer would be. Well, was, was that your question about? Just how, how things are, are handled. I, I don't know if you... Oh, I'm the one who wrote it. Oh, okay. I, I certainly do know what it says. Yes. I mean, is this common practice to handle things like this? And um, I, I don't want to interrupt, but um, our, our practice on public comments is, is a forum for people to express concerns and questions. Um, it, it typically doesn't end up in a, in a dialogue. Okay. Um, although there could be dialogue afterwards. And certainly if people ask questions, uh, we make note of that and make sure to get responses back to the people that, that, um, you know, that have the questions and have the concerns. Okay. I'll, I'll be sure um, to follow up with you. Okay. Yeah. Um, just... We do appreciate you coming this evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Next up is um, on the agenda, we have our informational items. And the first one is our career technical education program review. Dr. Crystal Barr, welcome. Good evening. So our Career and Techno Technical Education Program Review um, is, our, whoops. Having a technical problem. <laughs> of course on the technical on the te program review. <laughs> I'm not a career and technical teacher, no. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I press this side. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Our team members included both administrators and um, teachers in several of our um, departments, business, industrial tech, and family and consumer science. Do I press this? There, sorry. I apologize. Um, but three major areas um, are of focus, family and consumer science, marketing, and business education. Our high school program has 10 teachers uh, who are vocationally certified. Vocational certification is, is a step above just regular um, certification and that to be vocationally certified, teachers also need um, occupational experience outside of teaching. And so not every teacher is able um, to do that, um, but those who do can be certified to teach vocational classes. We do offer 41 classes in um, these three departments. That is a slight increase from two years ago. The last time we were here, it was 39. So they are trying to 
uh, increase those offerings, but then also at the same time, sometimes weed out some offerings that are no longer needed um, quite. And so, for instance, one of the classes we've recently weeded out was one that just ex exclusively talked about Excel and PowerPoint kind of in isolation, and we are embedding those now throughout all the courses so kids can really learn how to use them in a field instead of just in isolation. So um, that's the slight adjustment in the numbers. We also um, are able to send kids to other programs such as uh, Summit Tech and CAS Career Center where they can also take vocational coursework there. That is coursework that they don't take with us. We don't offer all of those programs. It would be very difficult for us to offer welding and fire science and all the different things that a career center can offer. Although I will say um, the number of kids that we are sending for certain things is down. For instance, Project Lead the Way, now that we're beginning to offer that, we are not sending kids out for that and so we're able to send then kids for different programs so we're better utilizing our slots I believe than we have um, ever before and then students can be awarded uh, an industry certification or um, credit for coursework uh, by taking certain assessments at the end of a series of courses our Perkins Act uh, does fund some of our um, cast career uh, in particular we help fund those programs that our students go to our students are able to um, also participate in some vocational organizations. So these are organizations that are related to the coursework. Um, so they're definitely more co-curricular. And those are just a few of them. The first three um, are housed with us. The FCCLA, which is related to our facts department. The FBLA, which is our business leaders. And then the DECA. Um, which is our distributive education um, students. The last two, um, Skills USA and the Future Educators Associations, are ones that kids are a part of at either Summit Tech or CAST Career. Our vocational enrollment has increased from the last time I was up here two years ago by 302 enrollments. So it is at a total of 2,337 course enrollments. Um, two years ago, it was at uh, 2,035. So we are definitely increasing student interest in, in those areas. We currently have 34 students at CAST Career and 24 at Summit Tech. Um, CAST Career does offer 31 courses and Summit Tech offers 20. They also always are very sure to pull those of us in from different districts representatives to ask us about, are these course offerings serving your needs? Are there other things kids are talking about that we um, should go and explore? So they're definitely very receptive to all the districts who send kids there to try to meet our needs. So they're offering programs that attract um, students. And a lot of the programs are multi-year. So many kids start in their junior year and finish it their senior year. Um, for the class of 2016, when we do that postgraduate follow-up, 97% of our uh, career and tech completers were placed in post-secondary education, advanced training, um, military, or related employment. And we're only at 97% because we couldn't reach three of them. Uh, we are still calling our post grads, but um, they're sometimes difficult to catch. Um, so that's the only reason we're at 97. We just haven't located those three yet. Previous mm -hmm. goals um, was by the end of the 15-16 school year, we would increase the percentage of our uh, students who pass their TSA, their Technical Skills Attainment, or their IRC, Industry Recognized Credential Exam, to a 90% pass rate. And we are at 92 percent pass rate at the end of um, 2016. So it's really, really good. That's going to be hard to continue to, to move up. We're going to continue to try. And then the other goal from the previous year was to increase the percentage of 11th and 12th graders who have or are currently enrolled in vocational courses associated with their chosen career path by 20%. Um, at the end, uh, right now, if we pulled this um, enrollment, we showed a 34% increase in 12th grade and a 48% increase in 11th grade. I will tell you some of that is just because we're doing a better job identifying the career paths kids are interested in. And so we're doing a much better job gathering that data so then it's easier to look at, okay, you said you're interested in marketing and now you're taking the coursework. So um, some of that had to be um, honed in on that, um, what career are you actually interested in before we could get those numbers up. So this is our scorecard. Um, our percentage of students who are enrolled in those vocational courses, um, that's at 69%. So that shows that increase that I just referenced. Our percentage of 11th graders who are, have been enrolled or are enrolled in courses associated with their path is at 61%. And again, that jumps because we're doing a better job identifying their career path. Um, our number of completers um, from either our high school, CAS Career or Summit Tech, uh, is at a 21.5. A completer is a student who takes a uh, three course series um, that is all aligned um, into one career path. So that's what we are looking at when we say completers. 
And then the percentage of students who are passing that TSA or IRC is at 92%, as I referred to earlier. Um, our percentage of complete completers who are in their field of study post high school, and that could mean that they're at the job um, site, um, they're in a tech school, they're in a four-year or a two-year program that is, focuses on that. That's what we're looking at when we're saying they're in their field of study, and that's currently at 57%. Um, and then our percentage of 12th grade students who are participating in a program-related experience, so they're in an internship, they've done a job shadowing experience, something like that, is at 24%. Quick question uh -huh. while you're on this. On the number of completers, you say they have to complete three. Are they able to do that in two years? Um, most of the time they're able to take a course with us that then leads into okay. um, two other years. Okay. So, yes, they're able to. Um, some kids are able to do that depending on the programming, not, okay. not everyone. Can, can you explain what a completer is one more time? Yeah, no, a completer is a student who has to take a series of three courses um, sequentially that lead um, up to a certain perhaps distinct career interest. So for instance, I could take um, personal finance, accounting one, and accounting two, and that definitely shows I'm interested in finance. Or our cooking uh, student could take foods and nutrition, pro start one, pro start two. So it's that kind of a sequence that they have to take in order to be considered a, a completer. Is that another area with the new building that we're going to be able to start as our own Pro Start 1 and 2? We currently offer Pro Start 1 okay. and 2. However, Absolutely. with the new building, I do believe there will be a lot more interest. Um, okay. it, is, it is a very um, well-done facility. Thank you. For our goals in the future, um, by the end of the 2018-19 school year, we want to complete the percentage of those completers who are in their field of study to 65%. So we want to make sure that um, our students really are in that right grouping of, of courses here so that they really want to take that post high school or go into the workforce with that particular job. And then our second goal is by the end of the 2018-19 school year, a percentage of 12th graders who have participated or are participating in that program related experience will increase to 42%. Really we feel that being able to participate in that definitely gives them another view of the job. It's one thing to learn about the job in the classroom, it's another thing to go on site and then go oh, this is really what that means. And so we feel like if kids have that, then they're better able to really make a good decision on this is truly what I want to do. And it's better to do that in high school than after two or four years of tuition payments. <laughs> Other opportunities for improvement. We want to continue to increase our enrollment in those vocational courses um, with our kids. And that also requires us continuing to offer courses that are of interest and meet their needs. We want to also um, place a focus on careers that are leading to college and career readiness. So for instance, our business department has realigned so that each series truly does lead to a technical skills attainment or an industry recognized credential. And they're not just taking a hodgepodge of classes, but they have clear pathways. Um, we'd like to, based on need, continue to make sure our budget allows our students to out access those outside of district opportunities like CAS Career Summit Tech and now Southland CAPS, um, which is another one opportunity we've um, talked to you about in the past. And then we need to continue to revise that career planning guide um, to update those pathway documents so kids can continue to make the connection between coursework in high school and figuring out what I do or do not want to do in the future. We have not yet. I do know this spring um, the Kansas City area pulls all of us together who kind of deal with this topic and what, that is the spring topic and we would hear from some people from the state as what's on the agenda to talk about what does that really mean and then just to get a feel for what everybody's doing in their different districts. So that's up and coming. <laughs> that will probably be a DESI rulemaking process that will go through next year. I think it takes effect the following year so there will be a little bit of time to flush that all out. Other questions? This is going because I think a lot of students are going to be able to utilize some of these programs rather than going to four years of college. They're going to be able to find what they like to do and go straight into it. I would agree. Some of the um, programs that are pro start is a perfect example. If you have a pro start certification, that means a lot in the industry. It means a lot if you wanted to go to Jans Johnson County Community College, which has an incredible culinary arts program. So kids are leaving with more opportunities than than just in the old days when you just took a cooking class. <laughs> And Summit Technology is relatively new. Mm -hmm. Fairly new. How, how long have they been? 
Oh, gosh. I, I believe they're under a decade. And I do know they're also building a new facility, which will be open next year. And I think that will continue to expand what they're able to offer because it is a bigger facility than where they're at. And that is one place where they offer maybe some of the capstone project lead the way courses, but by us offering some locally, we're able to keep our kids here. And then the capstone courses, which maybe only, you know, one or two or three kids in a one school might access, they can offer it at Summit Tech and we can send them all there to experience that. So it's a it's a nice partnership. Do there we their new facility is scheduled to be open for next fall, and you will get invited to their ribbon cutting. At, I believe it's September 4th, but I'll send out some additional information later on that. But we, we do send students there, and uh, uh, the new facility won't look like a school that you're used to. Um, very open-ended and a lot of project-based learning and just really interesting. And we've got a few elements like that in our high school design, but it's kind of to that next level, if you will. So, I have a couple of questions. On Summit Tech... Are they only t are junior and seniors that we send, like at Cast Career? Typically, their programming only lends itself to juniors and seniors, okay. just because I, of some of the I've, prerequisites. I've asked the question, and I don't know if I've ever got an answer, or if we, maybe I haven't looked, about starting kids in ninth grade to go to Cast Career and Summit. And I know there's only limited spaces for those, but I know some kids, I know they offer some programs that they could do one program is ninth and 10th graders, and then maybe do another, then they can kind of see where they'd like to go. We did follow up on that. Our ni well, I mean, I, we did do the follow-up. So, um, but it. the ninth and 10th classes are, are more your Project Lead the Way classes, which we are currently offering here. Okay. And so we are, are going to start offering. So because we're offering them here, we're able to keep okay. them here at, at a much reduced cost. Catch some of those kids yeah. at the ninth and 10th grade that some, can't go to the others. Some of those other programs have certain prerequisites in order to meet all your graduation requirements. You need to kind of get some of those out of the way before you can go. So mm -hmm. the nice thing about the project lead the way is that we can at least get them started in a, two or three different fields before they, before they leave us to go to do a capstone or to cash career. And that's a good point because some of our kids especially with CAS Career, because the program maybe lasts all day or a big chunk of the day. Kids have to take their on, you know, like online government. They, they have to make some adjustments to their schedule that they really can't always do at a younger uh, grade level because transportation takes away a block of their time. Okay, any other questions? Thank you very Thank much. You. I notice you're up next on the A-plus <laughs> update as well. Yeah. So. So this is our we'll annual A plus update, or yes, I do. I do this annually. Um, a plus, just as a reminder, it is uh, um, funded by our state. Students have to have a 2.5 unweighted GPA, cumulative, 95% attendance, good citizenship, and 50 hours of tutoring or mentoring. Uh, this allows them the opportunity to earn two years of tuition um, from community colleges, tech schools. Um, so it doesn't quite pay for books, but it does pay for a majority of it. And so this is kind of an update just on where we are with our students. And so right now, our seniors, um, 280 out of 370, so about a little over 75%, have enrolled in the A-plus program. Our juniors are not far behind at a 74.5%. Sophomore, 64.2 of that class has signed up, and freshmen, 53.2. It's not uncommon for that to be descending. Um, you know, some kids don't think about it. Some kids are thinking, I'm going to four-year, and then as they get a little older, realize two-year might be a better option, or sometimes their parents realize that's a better option, and so it, it makes sense that it continues to um, climb as we have more time with the students. As far as students who actually qualify, because you can sign up, anybody can sign up, but then who meets those criteria that I just went over? Um, this last year's class, 58.2% uh, of them may, met all of those criteria. In 2015, 54.7, 2014 was 48.1, and 2013 was 69.4. So we had lost a little ground in 14, but we're on our way to gaining that back um, on the students who are qualifying. As I mentioned in my earlier presentation, we do that postgraduate follow-up just to find out what kids are doing um, after, after they leave us. And this is kind of a snapshot. It's related in the fact that we also follow up on all those who are in two-year. And so in 2014, 
We had 100 students who said that they were in a two-year college and 174 in a four-year. Um, 2015, we had 115 students in a two-year and 177 in a four-year, so very slight gains in both of those, but still gains. And then in 2016, so far, because I do think we still have about 25 kids we're trying to track down, um, 116 kids in a two-year and 192 kids in, in a four-year college. So um, we are having um, more and more kids make that choice um, to continue their education in some format. Percentage-wise, last year's class was one of the uh, strongest placement rates we've, we've had. So I think that's a culmination of a lot of efforts to do get kids more focused on what they're going to do after school. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, a plus financial benefit, because there is a financial benefit when we look at how many of our students are really taking advantage of that. Typically, this time of year, we only have the fall report. Uh, this year, we had the fall and the spring semester report, so that's why you're seeing both of those figures, uh, as opposed to in previous years when we only had the fall. So in the fall, this was a benefit of over $146,000 um, to our families. And then in the spring, it's $130,000, um, a little over that. And so um, a great benefit, lots of tuition savings um, for our students. And then also on a related note, just in looking at um, postgraduates, uh, we do a FAFSA frenzy night um, for families. Who, the FAFSA can be intimidating. It can be hard um, to get through. And so they do offer, the high school offers a FAFSA frenzy that allows them to get really one-on-one, -on -one, you know, advice, support, walking through that process. We had 17 families participate in that. And um, that's been a pretty common number. Um, we've been right in there with one or two families every year. We have a Missouri FAFSA completion project. This is new data um, for us. And so we can now... Our counselors can pull up to see how many families have really completed the FAFSA. We've not been able to do that in the past. It was just a mystery, and then sometimes you would ask a student, have you finished it? Sure. Maybe, maybe not. Um, this allows our counselors to pull the kids up and be able to see how many really have completed, and if they haven't, what's the issue? Is what's not complete? And then they can follow back up with the families and the students, say, hey, you just didn't hit submit, or hey, you just need this one piece of information. So this is a huge benefit. And as of right now, we have 232 um, who have completed. Um, so far, we know this is more than last year um, at this time. So definitely a very helpful um, bit of information for our counselors that they can build on. And then 127 seniors are on track to complete mobile enrollment with MCC. So MCC works with us to help kids get all through their enrollment process and sign up for classes and get registered. A lot of times that's a hang-up with families who, particularly first time ever college goers, um, the families, they didn't sign up for college, so they're not sure how to have their student. And so this has been very helpful in um, helping our families get their kids enrolled. And the more likely, the farther they go down this process with the FAFSA and the enrollment, the more likely they are to step on a campus in August when we're all not around to support them. So that's very exciting as, as well that we have that many. And for those who don't know FAFSA? It is the financial, uh, good question, financial document that um, students have to fill out in order to see if they meet any other kind of state or federal finance needs. Uh, the state does, when they look at your A+, you're required to fill out the FAFSA because if you can get a Pell Grant um, from, from the federal government, then they're definitely going to say, we'll take that and then we'll supplement with A+. Plus. So they, they look at being efficient with their money as well, which is good because then they can serve more kids. The 127 seniors on track for MCC enrollment, you know, we, we get a report each fall to see how many students actually go to MCC. They, they share that information with us, and it varies anywhere from usually about 80 to 100. So um, it'll be interesting to see if that, what the number looks like next fall to actually who gets to campus uh, for, the, for the first semester. There's a term called summer melt where a lot of kids who have big college plans suddenly get distracted by life in the summertime and they don't make it to that first day. So we're trying to uh, make the channels very easy and direct for them to be able to make that transition. Well, from a parent's perspective, I would like to say it, our counseling department has gotten much better as far as helping parents understand where we're at. You know, I'm on my fourth one through the high school now, and I like the parent email that we get that we kind of see a checklist. You know, your student is this year in high school. This is potentially what should be on their radar, mm -hmm. and it walks them through each year. And I think mm -hmm. that's a great piece for the parents to see, and especially if it is their first one, yeah, but they even if it's their last one to see the changes. Done a nice job, and their, their focus is on trying to make it more accessible for parents and really looking at, you know, 
what do you forget? Even mm-hmm. if you went to college, that was so long ago. I don't remember what my parents did for me. Or I'm a first first generation. Well, and things change even between kids. Know. Systems change. Mm-hmm. Or so different it, colleges are different. Yeah, so, so yes. it's been, a, a, I think, a really good thing for parents that we've started with that email system. I'll tell them. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Okay. Well, thank thank you. you very much. We appreciate it. We also have some board policies on the agenda tonight for first reading, and they'll be coming up um, at our next meeting. If there are any questions, I'll be glad to entertain them, but the Policy Review, Review Committee reviewed these. These are all provided to us by MSBA in this case for updates and revisions. All right, we'll go on to our action items. And first up, Ms. Lisa Hatfield with our 2017-18 staffing positions. Thank you. Um, As we discussed at the work session on the 9th, there are some staffing positions that administration is recommending for approval for this upcoming school year. We'd like to get started on that hiring process and begin to get some good people for those spots. The chart there um, outlines for you um, the basic categories. The top portion has a lot to do with our grade level reconfiguration and needs that that um, caused. And then the bottom is, you will see, is addressed mostly towards our early learning center. Um, Lots of conversations about that, and these are employees that we need to make that program successful. Also, as we discussed on the 9th, um, there is some offsetting costs for these um, proposed items. The um, contracted services for the special education department will be reduced, and that will offset the .37 process coordinator that we're requesting And then also the additions to the Panther Pride staff hours, we believe that tuition will um, help that and so that we won't have to um, totally encumber that. So the estimated net cost of the recommended um, staffing positions is $349,000. That is just the salary cost. It's not the associated supplies or anything like that. Um, But we are asking for you to give us approval so that we can move forward and begin the process for next year. On the physical therapist and some of those positions, if we're able to apply for Medicaid reimbursement from any of those, does that help reduce our cost any? Yes, our special education department looks at that. If a student would qualify, yes. Unfortunately, it's a relatively small, small number. Part of reimbursement, <laughs> sure. so. okay. yeah. Does anyone have any questions regarding this? As Lisa mentioned, we spent a good deal of time talking mm-hmm. through all of this at the work session. Yes. Um, so at this point, this is review. Um, at this time, is there a motion? Or do we need to do the next one, too? No, this was fine. Okay. Well, there were two. Okay. It was just a supporting document. Okay. I move to approve the proposed staffing additions as presented. Is there a second? A second. Okay. Any further discussion or questions? All right. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Next, we have our MSBA Regional Executive Committee Chair nomination. Um, We've been very fortunate um, that Ruth has been serving um, as our representative to the MSBA, and they sent out um, an email in the past month or two requesting people who are interested to sign up or to indicate their interest, and Ruth indicated interest and is willing to continue serving on that. And so uh, this item is um, to ask for the board's endorsement for Ruth to um, run as the MSBA Regional Executive Committee Chair for Region 4. And and I do have a question about that. Since we're getting so close to the election and Ruth is running to be reelected, why don't we wait a couple weeks until the election has been it has to be sent in by the end of March. And yeah, if I am not reelected for some reason, they then would take care of, ref- of refilling that position. Yeah, at this point, because this Ruth happens is, on an ongoing um, basis with them. Yeah. As I understand it, no one else on the board indicated interest. Mm-hmm. And so the, the time frame for indicating interest to the MSBA has passed. And so the only person we can nominate at this point would be Ruth because no one else indicated interest. Is my understanding is that? Yeah, the, okay. Ruth mentioned that the deadline to submit is end of March. So MSBA is used to this scenario where somebody may not be filled back in, and in that case they, they have other candidates potentially that could be. So if there are other candidates, she'd be up for election, and, and, and if she's not available for that, then the other candidates would be considered. So. Right. Okay. Okay, any other questions on this? 
All right, is there a motion? I move to endorse Ruth Johnson for the position of the Regional Executive Committee Chair for Missouri School Boards Association. Is there a second? A second. Okay, any further discussion? All right, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Okay, motion passes. Next, we have our Wireless Access Points Bid Award. Mr. Ryan Gooding will be presenting on that. As he sprints to the podium from the back of the room. <laughs> Good evening. I've got three bids to present uh, to you guys tonight. So uh, the first one is for wire wireless access points. I just want to remind you guys that the federal E-rate program eligibility guidelines changed in 2015. And under these new guidelines, schools can receive reimbursement funding for wireless infrastructure for the 16, 17, and 17, 18 school years, which is what we're talking about tonight, wireless infrastructure. Uh, Raypex School District expects to receive approximately a 50% reimbursement for the expenditures for this particular bid that we're talking about. Over the course of the past year, the technology staff, staff has worked to design a network capable of handling the increased traffic expected upon the completion of the high school edition. The proposed wireless network equipment will focus on addressing wireless access for students and staff throughout the new edition. The proposed access points are compatible with our existing network and designed to allow seamless connectivity in all the new areas of the building. So we released a, an RFP request for proposals um, and we received bids from eight separate vendors. And so tonight uh, the administration is recommending that the board approve the purchase of wireless networking licenses and equipment from Direct Technology for $39,946.50. I'd be happy used, to entertain any questions if... Have we used direct technology before? We have not, no. Did we do some research on them to make sure that we were... Yeah, the biggest piece of research, really, they are just an, an in-between person. Who we buy these access points for, the, the company will not sell direct to school districts, so we have to find some kind of supplier. So we chose to open it up to anybody that wanted to bid for it. It's kind of in the district's best interest that way. It's right. kind of... This, this bid here was kind of a race to zero for, for the vendors. I, they, they did not make very much money on, on that price that they sent us right there. So, so if we get 50% reimbursement, is that 50% of 39000 Yes. And so we would actually be approving 50% of that. So um, how E-Ray works, we have to, to pay the money up front, mm -hmm. and then we get a lump sum from them back. About 12 months later. Yeah, so. it's, it's quite a period of time before we get it back, but, but we have to pay it up front, and then, and then they reimburse it. And since our legislature has been um, changing so much, so many things in, the, in their budget, this is not something that they might change? I would never, on. ever say what the government will change or won't change, but this right. is a federal program, and there's, oh, there's still okay. lots of money that's, that is in in this program it, it has its own to, dedicated to, funding stream so it's not and subject to appropriation last year when i went to dc this was one of the things we talked with all of our legislators about is maintaining that e-rate yeah the internet to the classroom is the big push and where they put where they put that money so okay all right any other questions all right is there a motion i move to approve the bid for wireless <coughs> access points and networking licenses from direct technology in the amount of $39,946.50. Okay. Is there a second? I second. Any further questions or discussion? All, right. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes. And next we have the desktop computers bid okay. award. So uh, we, we released a, a second RFP um, and we received pricing for 210 desktop computers and monitors to be used in district classrooms. These desktop computers will replace the aging devices I talked with you about last week that are between eight and nine years old that are in our classrooms right now. Proposals received from 10 entities. All proposals were considered in the evaluation process, and we asked vendors to give us unit and warranty price per unit. Dell desktops were selected for a number of reasons, including their affordable price, de dependable performance, and affordable warranty that will increase daily uptime and the life of the machine over the next four years. The replacement includes 185 desktop computers that are going to be used at the high school, including the new addition they're putting in. These computers will directly impact students and teachers, and upgraded machines are needed in order to provide hardware for classrooms and curriculum and instruction. 
Also included are machines for expected growth and some minimal inventory to replace failed equipment that cannot be repaired, programming changes, or any unexpected growth. And really, we have got this down as tight as we can to, to, to keep as, as little inventory as possible. Um, the remaining 25 computers out of that 210, they're going to support the Project Lead the Way program at the South Middle School. The, the equipment will be submitted for partial reimbursement under the DESE Enhancement Grants that uh, the board previously approved. And that's in uh, Crystal Barr has been a great help with, with putting that together, so I really appreciate her help with that as well. And this time we will get monitors, Crystal, so it will be a mm -hmm. full computer for you. It will be great. Just, just a clarification, the middle school grant application, we don't have the full details yet, so you'll probably see that hopefully next month. Um, but we need to buy the machines regardless, but we would expect to get 50% reimbursement on those machines. But um, either way, we need to purchase the machines for the program. Uh, so with that being said, the, the administration recommends that the Board of Education approve the purchase of desktop computers from Dell Computer Company for $139,218.50. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. So, so we're approving 185 computers, right, for the high school? 185 for the high school, yes. And these are only for the high school? Yes. And how many are going to be put in this category of expected growth or unexpected growth. And how did you come up with um, a figure for unexpected growth? And I'm, So I'm right now, our estimate is that we're going to need 174 computers. So that leaves us with 11. And these are computers or if we were to add a classroom late yeah. somewhere in the district. And these, so these are computers we're talking about all the teachers, all the front office staff, all the administrators, all the counselors, all the food service people. We're, we're, our goal is to replace all the computers in the building with the same device. And that allows us to have one image for our people when they go over there. It just makes it much more efficient for everybody. Are there any other questions? OK, so you expect 11 for the growth in staff, is that? Is that well, it, it, it could be growth. It could be growth anywhere. Maybe there's a spot in the cafeteria where uh, they come and ask us, "Can we put another line here because we want to be more efficient when we check out kids during lunch?" That okay. would be a, that would be an example of a place okay. where we could put another computer at, or maybe the coffee shop at the at our new in our new library needs a computer for for some reason. That would be another example. There's all kinds of reasons that for efficiency purposes where we could help staff if we could add another computer and it's nice to have some on on hand if we need to use that. It's also good if a computer goes down, we can take one that we have in stock and just immediately plug it in so the teacher doesn't lose or loses as little class time with that device as possible. Okay, and the price is quite a lot different for the warning and not warning. How, how long do the computers last anyway? Well, the computers that we have right now are going on about nine years, but I would not recommend that anybody put the kind of miles that we put on our computers and try to get nine years out of them. So this is a four-year warranty? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. So is it going to be actually used then? If, how, how long do you think the computer should last if, it, if it's not we, nine years? In, in the bet... And what we are trying to get accomplished, we would like to rotate computers out for teachers and staff every four years. We haven't had a history of doing that. We're trying to catch up in many cases with our replacement cycle, just so they're a little more current uh, throughout the district. So uh, the high school is obviously the biggest school we have, and there's a rotation. Ryan's got planned that will catch up two or three schools a year. The high school is the largest one by far, so it stands by itself this year. And it has, I think, some of the oldest machines. It does. Yes. What does the warranty cover on these? Everything. So if the, I know the teachers aren't supposed to, but if they pick it up and drop it, or <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know usually I mean, there's some kind of. Yeah. Um, if it is, 
So maybe I have to take that back. It doesn't cover everything. If, they're, if they see malice or vandalism, they're not going to cover that. But everyday basic use of the computer, they're, they're going to cover. So if it totally like freezes where we can't get it unfrozen. Yeah, if a hard drive goes bad, they will replace the hard drive. If a mother but motherboard goes bad, they'll replace the motherboard. The, all the all the parts years. and pieces in it are covered under the warranty. And, and, they, and Dell's really they good take about care of the the labor. Uh huh. And yeah. so if we didn't get the warranty, we would have to spend money hiring more staff for our own selves to take care of it, or. Possibly, or we pay we, repair people possibly. to take care of it. Okay. And, and the in the parts, more so than anything else, we would need more funds to pay for parts. Okay. Um, any more questions? Any other questions on this? All right. Is there a motion? I move to approve the bid for two hundred and ten desktop computers, monitors, and four year warranty from Dell Computer Company. In the amount of one hundred thirty-nine thousand two hundred eighteen dollars and fifty cents. Okay, is there a second? I second. Okay. Any further questions? And I knew there was one more thing I was thinking of. This, um, just as a reminder, in the budgeting process, when we have been uh, looking at, say, the five-year plans and the, the technology plan, mm -hmm. this is in cor is in part of the plans that yes. we have yes. seen. Yes. So mm -hmm. um, this has been included in our budget preparations. Okay. Yeah, and if you, if you remember, not that you, you didn't ask me another question, but if you remember the, the survey we took from teachers, mm -hmm. this is one of the biggest complaints that we get from teachers is that their well, computers the are slow their and, they're, yeah. yes, and they can't do what they need to do with them. So we're trying to address that as, as quickly as we can. Very good. All right. Uh, any further questions? All right. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes. And last... Mr. Gidding, we have the High School Television and Projector Bid yeah, so, Award. So this is the, of the three bids, it's the second of the three that really mm -hmm. has to do uh, with the expansion process that we, we've been doing at the high school. Uh, the technology staff solicited bids for audio and visual equipment in February of 2017. The requested equipment is intended for classroom and student spaces in the new high school edition. Televisions were selected for the majority of classrooms after gathering teacher and staff feedback regarding device preference. Televisions will, will present a cost savings over traditional projectors and smart board installations and require less maintenance from district staff. So uh, we sent out the RFP. We, we received 17 vendors who bid on the project. The lowest three bids that we received we had to reject because they were either incomplete or they did not meet the minimum specification included in the bid. And I can talk with you guys about that if, you, if you're interested. Was our bid clear? I mean, was it... Oh yes, okay. yeah. One of them forgot to bid a projector. Some of the projectors, so they were they were excluded. Um, others tried to give us consumer or consumer televisions, and the consumer televisions that they gave us don't meet the spec for the installation that we have at the in those new classrooms. All the inputs it wouldn't have wouldn't have worked with the inputs. And teachers do teachers do a lot more with the TV than you do at home. Whenever you you know you turn your cable on, turn your gaming system on whatever you do but so we, we had to have a little bit more complex model than what you would just walk into Sam's Club and purchase so with that being said the, the administration recommends that the Board of Education approve the purchase of televisions and projectors from Kansas City audiovisual for ninety six thousand four hundred and three dollars and just uh, add in uh, different sizes that you see are based on the size of the room and the space. So, like the band room would get the 80 inch type yeah. TV, band, much larger space, band, band choir. choir, theater is where the 80 inch televisions would go. The 70 inch televisions would be in your typical classroom. So, these are all of these TVs that we are purchasing are going in. I'd said this already, but they're going in student spaces. So these are not going in conference rooms. They're not going in people's offices. These are going st strictly for classroom instruction. We have a couple that will be hanging in the, uh, in the cafeteria for the students during lunch. Uh, but there are none in any, if, if you've done a walkthrough of the buildings and there's some mounts and some like counseling offices and things like that, we didn't purchase TVs for any of those, any of those spaces. So. It's strictly student student spaces that we're buying these for. And these are being used how, in, in the way the teachers used to with the projectors and the whiteboards. So they're using their 
laptops or desktops and projecting or mm -hmm. I guess not projecting now but yeah they do the, so, yeah a lot of times they, they will be projecting yeah okay so it's more of a and doing their lessons and things mm -hmm. that they have yeah, so on it's basically laptop. this is taking place of the smart board that they have in their classroom right now we will not be putting we have when we went through the process with teachers asking them what their preference was we had a couple departments one in particular that said they preferred smart boards and so we made sure we got uh, projectors and smart boards for that group but outside of them everybody else was fine with with television so that's that's what we went with does all this have warranties with it also they they will have warranties yes because you're not doing if you if you go to to Sam's Club and you buy a consumer television and hang it in a business or a school the second you put it on the wall you void the warranty mm -hmm. so by getting these models of uh, televisions we are able to get the warranty that goes along with it okay, okay. Yeah. any other questions All right is there a motion I move to approve the high school television and projector bid from Kansas City audio visual in the amount of ninety six thousand four hundred three dollars is there a second I second any further questions or discussion all, right. all those in favor please raise your hand motion passes thank you thank you appreciate it Next up, we have our um, surplus property, Dr. Pettengill. Good evening. Tonight, I have seven line items for your consideration to be declared surplus property, and I would be happy to answer any questions about them. We have a van with 104,000 that needs major repairs already. The mileage is going to be surprisingly low with the type of mileage that it gets because they're work vans. Um, there are a lot of in town. They don't get any high. I mean, the mileage is going to appear low just because there's no highway traffic. It's all within the district, and I mean they use them pretty hard. They're working. Yeah, the work age bands. is probably the bigger concern. At 15 years. So. And so we're having problems with them, or are we? And they're at a point that it would. They're they're totaled. It would be more. It would not be wise to invest in them at this point. The repairs are more expensive. The repairs than are more expensive the than they're worth. So they do need repair at this point. Yeah. Is that they're repair? Yeah, they're not usable at this time. Okay. I w I would still like to see us as we replace these um, look at some alternative fuel um, vehicles instead of instead of the gas um, at some point and maybe not soon. Who knows? Um, Gas went down. It can also go up. So, I'm I'm not an expert on all that. But um, the the main question I had were on the um, French and Spanish textbooks. Yes. Um, it's... Why why are those being thrown out? Are we do we still use them? As we've aligned our curriculum through our ongoing curriculum review process, um, Dr. Barr is here. If I don't if I say this incorrectly, but aligning with the IB process and the more rigorous standards. Um, getting books that align with with that program. Does that make sense? Okay. I just want to make sure we're spending wisely when we buy things initially so that we're not throwing them out reselling them, whatever you want to call it, basically throwing them out because we, we get such a small price compared to the price that we paid for them. And um, we just need to make sure that we're spending wisely when we order initially. I think it's probably important to state here that these are often curriculum and teacher-driven regarding the, the rigor level that the teachers believe is appropriate for our students. So when we get to these levels, we've got a lot of staff input in what type of resource we need to ensure our students are using our academic standards. And so what grade level would these be? It just says high school. Would they? I'm thinking it's one and two. So ninth and ten. Depends okay. when you take one and two. I'd have to go back and check exactly. Okay. All right, thank okay. you. Any other questions? All right, is there a motion? I move to declare the property presented as surplus. And is there a second? I second. Any further discussion? All, right, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? 
Motion passes. And next we have the bid approval for the most recent surplus property. We only had a few things that um, I'm presenting to you to um, accept the bids on. We had two line items that were um, competitively, competitively bid and won. So I would ask for your approval to accept these bids. Okay. Any questions? Is there a motion? I move to approve the bids for surplus property as presented. Is there a second? I second. Okay. Any further questions or discussion? All right. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pettengill. All right. Our <coughs> next item, um, board policies. These had their first reading at our last meeting. And as I recall, most of these were driven by... These did come uh, from our policy service, updates. and m many of them were uh, statutory changes that uh, led into policy adjustments. Be glad to entertain any questions on specifics if you have them. Um, any questions? All right, is there a motion? I move to approve the board policies as presented. Is there a second? I second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. That motion passes. All right, we'll move on to committee reports. Are there any committee reports this evening? Uh, I had a regional meeting, and we did the regional Belcher scholarships. And, you know, it's amazing to look at these students and just um, what they've gained already as seniors in high school. Um, it's also humbling to see that how we've got good offerings in our district because there's a, a district that uh, the student – essay was talking about they don't even have a fax class because they can't afford it so it just goes back to hit home that you know we we are very fortunate in the fact that we've got the offerings we do for our students at all levels um, and then I was able to go to Jeff City last week for the Cass County Kids First and talked with all of our legislators um, specifically hitting on the House Bill 634 that passed through the House today unfortunately but we did talk with all of our legislators and gave them points as to you know why we were not in support of it so working on that continually. Okay, thank you. Um, any other committee reports? All right. Superintendent's report, Dr. Monson. Yeah, I do want to wish uh, Joel Miles good luck again for his trip to D.C. You know, he's represented us well so many times, so he's got one more chance, and hopefully he'll <laughs> get on to the next round, and that'll be exciting. It's always fun to watch. I uh, also want to wish good luck to our robotics team who start their formal competition in the morning around 9 o'clock. So they are already in place up there and uh, should be an exciting couple of days for them. Uh, to add, add to Bruce's Bruce comments about House Bill 634, we don't spend a lot of time about uh, talking about bills and political issues typically in our board meetings, but this is one worth mentioning. Um, charter school expansion is the nature of the bill. And I, we have three different House members who cover our district, and we've been in close contact with them throughout the session to talk about uh, this bill and what impact it might have on us. And I am proud to say that uh, two of our representatives, Jack Bonden and Joe Runyon, voted against it, which was what our preference there was. So we want to thank them for voting no against it. Uh, and I'll let you know there's a provision in that bill to where if there is a school, neighboring school district, say in Jackson County, that has one failing school within it by the APR method of counting things, where they're below 60% of their APR, it just takes one school in a neighboring district and it opens up that charter school opportunity for that entire district and all districts in neighboring counties, in our case. So there's a scenario where if there's a charter school that opens in Jackson County, and they don't fill up with their own resident district students, our students could go there, our local tax money could go with that student to that school, and we have no control or say over that tax money who would be leaving our district, and in this case, potentially our county. So um, it's, <clears throat> it's not all the way through the process yet. Uh, we were very close to getting it defeated today within two votes. Um, so we'll see what happens on the Senate side and whether or not um, – we get another chance, so to speak, at, at resolving that. So just wanted to mention that and make it uh, known that we did have two local reps that did support us in that effort. Um, I do want to offer best wishes for a safe spring break next week. So everybody will get a, uh, uh, hopefully a nice weather break uh, next week. We had a very nice February, but here the last week or so, it hasn't been quite as nice. And then publicly, I want to thank Barbara Boucher for her service here to the school board over these past three years and a term previously 
Uh, this is her last regular meeting, and I just wanted to thank her publicly for her service to the district. I appreciate that. And just to back up something he said, when we talk with our legislators, we stay, we try to stay very non-political. I mean, when we talk to them, we give them numbers. You know, our superintendents are wonderful when we go up there giving us numbers to support why we are for or against a bill. So we present it in that manner, not as in a political issue. All right. Um, board member comments? I have uh, a comment about the the work session this past week that we had, um, we discussed strings, the strings program quite a lot. And um, then, as you know, we received communication from a patron and, and a teacher about that um, this past week. And um, I would hope that we'll pay attention to patrons and um, inform people about, about the string pro, pro, strings program and that we'll continue to um, pursue this course offering for our students. I think it's wor very worthwhile um, for them. Yeah, I think at the work session um, we were all pretty much in agreement in the uh, desire to be able to have that program and so I'm looking forward to our planning process in the coming year, um, seeing how we can get that to fit in. Any other board member comments? Um, I would just encourage people to go vote. We've got the election coming up in a couple weeks, and I would encourage everyone to get informed and, and vote. Um, I was able to attend the gala again this year, and again, they did a phenomenal job. Our kids and teachers will gain from what was raised that night. Um, Cass County Spelling Bee, I was able to come to that. that was, it's always fun to sit and watch those kids. Um, and then it was interesting yesterday, or Wednesday, uh, yesterday, I got to go up. Uh, volunteer it with the CAN program and pick up from a couple of our elementaries. And it's always fun to go to those buildings and see how well they, they individualize their buildings. You know, and you drive up, and when parents are coming in the front door, it's so welcoming. You know, they've got their banners up of something they've achieved or that their students have done. And I'm just so impressed every time how welcoming our buildings are to the, to the students and staff when they come in. So they do a great job. Any other comments? And uh, Ruth mentioned the gala. Um, I would just like to take a minute to thank everyone who helped with the gala. Um, we're very fortunate to have our uh, RAPEC Public School Foundation um, doing all the work that they do to help um, our teachers and our students. A lot of great programs going on there with the CAM program, RAPEC Cares, and um, the gala I think was a great success and um, raised a lot of funds to help the foundation. So very grateful for everyone who supported that and helped in any way. I, I see faces out there that I know helped. So thanks to everyone on that. All right. Um, next item is our calendar of events. So meetings coming up. Um, well, first of all, we have spring break next week. Then March 30th, we're having a special board meeting at 6 o'clock here. April 6th, teacher and support staff employee, year, employee of the year banquet at 6 o'clock. On April 18th will be the board reorganizational meeting at 6.30 here. And then April 27th will be the next regular board meeting um, after that. And there's nothing else. We are adjourned. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>